Hello everybody, in today's little uh, physics lesson we're going to talk about sound. I'm going to start with some of the basics of sound. We're going to have an opportunity to look at several different things. I'm going to have to go back and just do a little bit of a reminder about waves in general and how those are relevant for sound waves. Then I'm going to briefly talk about how you can hear with the ear. I'm not really going to go into any of the biology, but I will mention things about the eardrum and how that actually works. I'm also going to have an opportunity to talk about the Doppler effect, which is a pretty cool thing. So let's start with the age old question. If a tree falls in the forest and nobody is around to hear it, does it make a sound? I argue, yes, it does make a sound. Of course, somebody could start to get philosophical on us and they could say, well, I don't really think that you can have a sound if nobody's around to hear it. I would argue that we at least get a compression wave, the release of energy that causes a compression wave, that it's going to expand out in all different directions. That's always going to be there, even if nobody's around to hear it. Now, it just so happens that my ear interprets a compression wave as a sound. Let's start with that idea. Remember, and in fact you can look back on one of my previous videos to see that a longitudinal wave is defined as a wave that has particle motion moving back and forth in the same direction as the energy is being transferred. And so as I've drawn it up here, if energy is being transferred in the horizontal, then my particle motion is also going to be in the horizontal. That makes a longitudinal wave, same thing to call it a compression wave. We're going to help visualize this by using FET. I always like to make sure people understand that I did not create these simulations uh, that I'm about to show. They were created by uh, FET, which is a program through the University of Colorado at Boulder. I love the simulations. I think they're really great for helping people understand some physics and chemistry, uh, as well as some of the other topics they look at. Here we are looking at one of the FET simulations. This one is called Wave Interface. It allows me to visualize what a sound wave would look like, where each of these little spheres here is actually supposed to be a particle within the air. Remember, this is a compression wave that's going to travel through the air. Right now, I have this set up, and so everything is stationary. I'm going to go ahead and hit the play button here, let this wave start moving, and you should see a cycle of wave starting to propagate out from the central speaker here. Notice that there are some regions that have compressed particles. There are other regions that seem to be very light in particles, as in it's not a very high density. That is what we're looking at when we have a compression wave. We are compressing the particles in some regions, but in that compression there must be the alternative region that has actually fewer particles that propagates out. When that hits our ears, we call that a sound wave. To look at that information with something of a more still shot, let me come back to our general discussion of a wave. Recall that we have something called the principal axis, which is kind of the central point. It is the equilibrium position for a wave. The high point of a wave we all often call the crest. The low point is the trough. The distance between a crest and another crest, the adjacent crest, is something that we call the wavelength. In this particular picture, I'm showing that energy is being transferred from left to right. We can take a more specific look at what's going on for a sound wave, which we're going to do here. That principal axis, I said is the equilibrium point. For a sound wave, that is going to be the equilibrium pressure of a room or of whatever environment you're in. So that's going to be the average pressure. That means that you have an average density of particles at the principal axis. For a real life sound wave, it's amazing how small the pressure difference is that your ear can still pick up. Based on something that is a 40 decibel sound wave, so decibels are the units that we use in order to measure sound, and it's on a logarithm scale. For 40 decibels, that would be equivalent of a quiet voice. You can see that while my equilibrium pressure would be at one point and then many zeros, so essentially exactly one atmosphere of pressure, a crest is only going to have a minimally different pressure, slightly, slightly larger. 
and the trough is going to have some symmetry about it. It's going to move down in pressure at the same magnitude that the crest had an increase in pressure. So that's 40 decibels. So this is looking at something that is now 100 decibels. 100 decibels is going to be loud. That's something that's going to be uh, nearly painful on your ears. I'm putting down here that it could be uh, standing right next to an emergency siren. So either on top of an ambulance or perhaps a fire truck. You can see that even with this incredibly loud sound, the pressure fluctuation that we see goes from our standard one atmosphere of pressure only up to uh, it looks like we're changing in the fifth decimal place. We're only gaining a tiny fraction of pressure and then it's going to swoop back down and we have an, an equivalent small change in pressure down at the trough. I want to remind you that the velocity of a wave is entirely dependent on the medium for which the wave is traveling in. So for most situations that we're particularly concerned about with sound, that means that the sound is traveling through the air and we're going to be at relatively standard temperatures and pressures. For us, that means that the velocity is going to be approximately 343 meters per second. This leads to the trick that sometimes you'll see people using. Uh, I've got a lot of family members that live on a farm and they like to use this trick here where if you see a, a flash of lightning and then you hear the thunder with some delay after it, you can actually use that information to figure out how far away the storm is. Down in the bottom corner here, I've identified that if there's about a three second delay, that corresponds to about one kilometer. And if a five second delay occurs, that corresponds to about one mile. Now the reason that this works is because the flash of light travels very, very fast. It travels at the speed of light, which is 300 million meters per second, very, very quickly. That lightning strike is the thing that produces sound. Now that sound wave takes a while to reach your ear relative to the light. So there's going to be the delay in there. And then really to figure out how far away the, the, the bolt of lightning was, you're using just a relatively s simple algebraic equation, the velocity is equal to distance divided by time. If we look at the ear to try to discover how we can actually hear because of these variations in pressure, let's take a brief look at what the human ear might look like. Uh, some of you who are pretty good with biology know that back uh, here there's something that's called the cochlea and that is a really important feature of the ear in order for us to pick up sounds. I'm not going to go into the details of how that works in this particular video, but then we have the, those three small bones that are behind the eardrum, and I'm trying to show that the eardrum is located right here. Now, when the pressure is high outside, it's going to press the eardrum in towards the inner part of your body. An analogy to this might be like you have high pressure inside of a balloon, and it can push the rubber outward. Well, if you decrease the pressure on the outside here, then you're going to end up with less uh, push on the eardrum and so it's not actually going to push into the uh, inner part of your head quite as much and in fact low pressure in an extreme situation would actually draw the eardrum out a little bit. From there we can get a little cycle that picks up and as the eardrum uh, finds all of these different increases and decreases in pressure you're going to get a little vibration that might look something like this. I'm just going back and forth here on these slides so that you can kind of see what that would look like. Now we're going to take a look at uh, an equation that's going to be useful for us. The velocity of a wave is equal to the frequency of the wave times lambda, which is the wavelength. I will remind you that the velocity is something that's determined by the medium. That's the second time I've brought that up here. The frequency of a wave is determined by the source. So my voice is being determined by me. The frequency of my voice is determined by me. An instrument might have a different frequency, a tuning fork. All these different things are going to control the frequency of the sound. The wavelength is going to be determined by making sure that this equation holds true. Specifically for sound, we can say the velocity is the speed of sound. When we're talking about sound in music, the frequency of the wave we tend to call the pitch. And that leaves our wavelength still unchanged. 
I'm going to give an example here for a velocity of sound of 343 meters per second. And if I use a frequency of middle C, which is 256 hertz, then I would have a wavelength that is approximately 1.34 meters. And so that's a pretty good wavelength between little high pressure zones.